There's no doubt, for example, that what happened October the 7th was a form of hell for the victims uh, and for their families. Um, there's also no doubt that for many living in Gaza, for many innocent Palestinians, it's, as we know, of the two million or so uh, residents and citizens there, they, uh, I think it's more than half are of child age, mm -hmm. and many are very young children, and many children are getting killed. And as a father, I'm sure as, uh, uh, like me, as a father, it is utterly heartbreaking to see so many mm. thousands of children being killed who have nothing, obviously, to do with this. Uh, again, this, this comes back to this moral quandary I have. Um, you know, it's interesting when you said enough is enough in that tweet, you know, some people are already saying, even if they're very sympathetic to Israel's need to take out Hamas, they're looking at these fairly apocalyptic scenes in Gaza and thinking enough is enough of that. You yeah. know, in other words, the, the, this, the, the revenge is already far greater in terms of death toll than the original appalling terror attacks. That, yeah, well, again, I guess is where the, I have a moral quandary. Well, the, the question is, I suppose, and I don't have an answer to this, is the most effective way of combating Hamas military? And part of the answer to that is, is the military eradication of Hamas even possible? Because as I said, and we can see it unfolding in real time, as Israel's more successful militarily and the casualties mount, the resistance to what they're doing is going to grow. Yeah. And so even if they could take out Hamas militarily, which isn't obvious given its interpenetration with the civilian population, it, all of what's going to be played out is going to be played out on the military front. And we can see that in the rising tide, let's say, of demonstrations around the Western world. And I would say those demonstrations are likely to get larger and more effective in precise proportion to Israel's success on the military side. And so then I would think, well, is there another way of restraining Hamas? And well, that's again, that brings us back to the Abraham Accords, because mm -hmm. They were the most promising thing that's happened in seven decades. You know, and I think it's, it's easy to underestimate what a miracle they were. The people who formulated the Abraham Accords had to fight the State Department. They tried to introduce it under Obama to begin with, right? The notion was, well, maybe we could, we could start the peace process with Israel without putting the Palestinians first. And that had been off the table conceptually in the State Department, as far as I've been informed, forever. And and then it was proposed during the Obama era, and it was rejected. And then it was proposed during the beginning of the Trump era and rejected, but eventually they, they carried the day. And then they did do an end run. And I think that actually put, I think that was actually good for, for the typical Palestinian, because it put a tremendous amount of a pre pressure on the Palestinian authorities, who are basically tyrants, who are more than willing to use their own citizens as cannon fodder, it put a lot of pressure on them to actually do something moving, moving towards a genuine peace, which is why now Iran, that's why Iran is so desperate to scuttling accords, of I think. Of course. You know? So I think the way through Ham Hamas, all things considered in the medium to long run, is to desperately extend the Abraham Accords as rapidly as possible. That's not a military victory, but, you know... Wait. When you it's look, easy to Jordan, do this from when, the armchair. When you look at the full history of this conflict, the seven decades of, of, of conflict between Israel and, and the Palestinians, Jonathan Friedland is a, is a very good, uh, respected Jewish journalist uh, for The Guardian in the UK. He wrote a very interesting column the other day saying, you know, you could argue that both sides have a just cause here. Mm. And he said that as a leading Jewish commentator, that historically, both sides have a just cause, and that it's important to remember that. And that's why passions run so high. It's why people care so much. And it's why racing to take sides uh, is a mistake in this conflict. What do you think of that? Well, I think that, you know, if there wasn't a lot to be said on both sides, then the conflict wouldn't drag on forever and be unresolvable. 
You know, I think at some point you do something like cut the Gordian knot, which I do think to some degree the Abraham Accords had begun to do. Yeah. You know, I think it's, I don't think Israel's going away, but I don't think the Palesti Palest Palestine isn't going away either. Yeah. And so those things have to be accepted. I, it looks to me like they have to be accepted as on the ground realities. Now the, the problem I've seen continually, I don't know, is that it's been convenient to use the Palestinians as an irritant to Israel in the West. And so the Palestinians have been held hostage. You know, the people who portray them as innocent victims presume that the Palestinians have been held hostage by the Jews, let's say. But I would say the Palestinians have been held hostage even more effectively by their own leadership and by those who are perfectly will willing to use them as the front man, the expendable front man to irritate Israel in the West. Well, you can't get peace under those circumstances. You know, and so Palestine is a reality that isn't going to go away and Israel's a reality that isn't going to go away and the Abraham Accords started to recognize that and there was move in the right direction and if that falls apart we're going to be back to where we were yeah. 15 I mean, years the, ago except worse. The, the interesting moment for me came when Israel turned off the power and the water. Um, they just were able to do that to two million people in Gaza. They could turn off the internet. And it struck me that that was a very vivid reminder that Israel effectively controls Gaza. It doesn't do so politically, but it does in reality. And that for many young people in Gaza, they know this, and they do feel that they've been living in a perpetual prison camp where their movement is controlled, where their access to basic things like water and energy and so on is controlled. Uh, and that in, until they get the freedom that they crave, this can never get resolved. Well, but I also you know, understand on the other side that the Israelis feel, how can we give freedom to a place that is run by a terror group who are literally committed to the eradication of not only Israel, but all Jewish people? Well, you laid out, you laid out what are the two sets of valid counterclaims. I mean, there's another complicating factor too. You know, you, you said that you, you know, your moral back is up because of the continual toll in civilians in Palestine, especially among people who, let's say, weren't even born when they first came to power. Uh. And so it's very difficult to look at that and see it as anything but unjust. But then it begs a whole other set of questions too, doesn't it? It's like, well, if your government is a totalitarian band of armed criminal thugs, what responsibility do you bear for that as, as the subjected people? And, you know, it's not like I know the answer to that. But, you know, I see in my own country in Canada that things are slipping and sliding in all sorts of pathological directions and people are letting it happen. And if you let that happen long enough, well, things get very, very bad. And, they have got very, very bad in Palestine, and the answer to whatever tyranny Israel might be exerting over the Palestinians isn't for the Palestinians to exert even more tyranny over themselves, especially not in concert with a third party like Iran, who's perfectly willing to sacrifice them at any point. And so now, and then that question emerges, well, what responsibility do the Palestinians bear? Well, then I think we start to touch on more metaphysical issues. It's like, well, the Palestinians, like all people, bear the responsibility to live in truth and to stand up to tyranny in their, in their deeds, their attention and their deeds and their actions. Because if you don't, you pay for that, and so do your children, right? And then so do your grandchildren, and so do your great-grandchildren. You know, there seems to be something unjust in that, in that why did the children suffer? And the biblical answer to that has always been, well, the children suffer for the sins of their forefathers. And you might think, well, it's pretty unfair that the world is set up that way. It's like, hey, it might be unfair, but it is set up that way, and it does beg the question, what responsibility do the people who are living under the thumb of totalitarians have for the fact that they're living under the thumb of totalitarians? And the answer isn't none. So this is why no, I'm a psychologist, not a politician, I would no, say. No, because, it's, no, but I, 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 I think it's a really interesting question. It's also an interesting question why 
Why won't Arab states around Gaza take in Palestinian refugees? I mean, these are legitimate right. questions. Right. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of chain and saber rattling about how tyrannical Israel is, and of course, they're held to a very higher moral standard. But you know, the prison that is Palestine has walls on sides that aren't Israeli. So, and that no one, is certainly not the progressives, will never talk about that. And that's partly because, you know, all the oppressed people are equally morally virtuous. And so the fact that the Arabs won't take in the Palestinians, you can't even bring that up because, of course, the Arabs themselves are victims of Western colonialism, which is, you know, one of the most absurd propositions ever set forth by anyone about anything. But, you know, here we are. And it is quite a miracle in some ways that that... The, the multi-dimensional fact of Palestinian enslavement isn't discussed in a much more forthright manner. There's many people are building the walls that, that make Palestine into whatever prison it is. And perhaps the Israelis are playing their role, but they're by no means the only actors. 